our readings today um, focus really on two things uh, which are unappealing in our modern context. Um, the Old Testament readings uh, talk about the law, the giving of the law, and then in the psalm, the goodness of the law, the purity of the law, um, the desire to walk in step with the law and to reflect the law, God's perfect law in our lives. Uh, of course, the theme in our gospel reading is a slightly different one, but equally unappealing to many people. It's the theme of zeal, uh, particularly the zeal of, of Jesus. And it's that that I want to speak about mainly this morning, although the two themes are, of course, related. Um, but before I do, just to recognise that zeal has not a great reputation amongst us, uh, generally speaking. Um, now, part of that is that we are Australians. We're not into zeal, generally. Um, we're a pretty relaxed bunch, or we like to think of ourselves that way. And anything that smacks of too much zeal, particularly religious zeal, uh, we dismiss as wowserism or, or something along those lines. Uh, part of our resistance also is that, of course, nobody really enjoys the company of the hectoring person who, whose belief that you need to hear their point of view just overrides all good manners and uh, social mores. And partly, of course, there is just a deep suspicion in Western culture, not about zeal per se, not about social causes necessarily, but certainly about what we might call religious zeal. Uh, Richard Dawkins, who really launched the movement that we identify now as the movement of the new atheists, was motivated partly by the, um, the, the Twin Towers coming down in New York City, and he saw religious zeal as the great problem that he needed to address. But I think possibly the biggest turnoff when it comes to speaking about zeal is this. It is that the call to zeal comes across as a call for us to manufacture some emotion that actually is not in our power to manufacture. If I were to stand here this morning and tell you all that I want you to be more zealous, uh, many of you would perhaps, for my sake, try to pretend that it was working. Uh, but the reality is, most people would leave feeling that they're just carrying another burden in an already burdened life. The person who is feeling burdened, the person who is feeling oppressed by thoughts or feelings or circumstances will just have another thing to feel inadequate about. Now, the Bible itself um, speaks about zeal in a mixed way. Uh, sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's definitely not. The Greek word for zeal can just mean, can just describe a positive interest or a passion or a dedication to some particular cause. But it can also be used negatively to talk about jealousy, resentment of another person. It can give rise in scripture to the persecution of the innocent. It can also be a, a word that describes the process of factionalism. And of course, uh, the scriptures warn us against zeal that is not according to knowledge. Some people are all enthusiasm, they are all zeal, but they honestly do not know what they're talking about, and it's dangerous. So today, what I want to do is speak about zeal in a good sense, but not in the, not in the sense of it applying necessarily in a direct way to you or to me, um, but to talk about the zeal of Jesus. Because at Lent, of course, uh, we turn our minds to him. It's, it's him that our focus is primarily on. It's his sufferings for us. It's his accomplishments for us. And it is his zeal, not our zeal, that saves us and that's on display today. There are a few occasions, for instance, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, when he'll make some grand promise and he will say, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, it's not going to be your doing. This is going to be God's doing and his zeal on your behalf, his positive determination to save his people. John chapter 2 is possibly the great example of Jesus' zeal. I think I'm right in saying it's the only use of the word zeal in the Gospels. Um, and actually, as we look at what Jesus does in the reading that we've just heard, it might confirm some of our suspicions about this whole Thing, that is this thing called zeal and just how distasteful it can be. Frankly, it's a little bit violent uh, and it's a little bit much. It's an event that's recorded by all four of the Gospels. The other Gospels place it right near the end of Jesus' ministry, just before his, uh, the climactic events of his, uh, what, what leads to his trial. 
John's Gospel puts this event right up front, right at the start of Jesus' ministry. Now, it could be that this is actually something that happened more than once in his lifetime, that Jesus just couldn't get within arm's length of a temple without causing a massive stir. Or possibly John is wanting to emphasise this aspect of Jesus' ministry up front, his zealous assault on the temple precinct and all that it represents. As I read this passage, though, one of the things that's, that I think John is wanting us to notice is just the sheer impropriety of what Jesus discovers in the temple. In verse 14, in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. It's happening in the temple. As we read that, I think we, we just instinctively know this feels wrong. Now, it's not necessarily that purchasing animals to then be sacrificed in the temple was a problem. I mean, if you're the one walking from Galilee to Jerusalem to make an animal sacrifice, it's probably better to purchase an animal there than carry your sheep or your, your, your cow the whole way. Um, but, but there are some things that are you know, ill-fitting in this context. The hubbub and the selling is occurring within the holy site of God's temple. This is the dwelling place of God Most High. This seems unfitting. Anyone from any religion knows that a temple is where a God lives, but this is not a temple. This is the temple. This is Israel's temple where the God dwells, the God of all the earth. This is the God Yahweh, the God of holiness, whose purity of character is reflected in the Ten Commandments and the law. And the appropriate state for a temple is a state of purity. This is God's house. Some things that might be okay in another context are not okay in this context. And so when Jesus sees a marketplace in his father's house, it's, it's good by Jesus meek and mild and we get a bit of wrath. This is, this is Jesus demonstrating zeal. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, there's a great story which probably is the great story of zeal of uh, righteous zeal. It happens back in Numbers chapter 25 and it's the story of a fellow named Phineas. Uh, basically what's happened is that uh, the people of Israel have been rescued from Egypt. They go to um, hear the giving of the law. So the Lord speaks to them from the mountain. They're, they're, they're given the law and then they begin their desert wanderings to the promised land. But on the way, they face various trials and temptations and one of those is that they are led astray to worship the gods of the Moabites. And the way that happens is through intermarriage and sexual relationships with, with the, the people of Moab. And God's anger is stirred up and a plague erupts. Now, in, in Numbers 25, the whole community is gathered around the temple of uh, the tent of meeting, which is, note, the forerunner of the temple. Okay, so we have another temple scene. And uh, they are gathered around the tent of meeting and they are weeping at their sin and what's happening amongst them. And as they are weeping and mourning and grieving what's going on, a man who is a leader within their community walks past them with a Moabite woman uh, and goes into his tent with her. She's a woman of high standing in the Moabite community. And it's, it's pretty clear that there's some kind of uh, intimate relationship happening. It's very clear, actually, because what happens is Phineas... Um, who is in the story, he grabs a spear, he follows them into the tent, and with one throw of the spear, he manages to kill them both. <laughs> so that's the moment when the plague stops. Now, Phineas is a Levite. Uh, he's, a, he's a priest. His job is to enforce purity. And he becomes the great example in the Old Testament of zeal. And you can see in that story how zeal has a purifying intent. It sees something it regards as holy that has become sullied and dirtied and it seeks to purify. And yes, it can be quite violent. Well, Jesus is shown in this text as the zealous purifier. He enters the, most, he enters the holy place that has been corrupted and he cleans it. His zeal is not directed against the outsider, his zeal is directed against the insider, the member of the community that should know better, that's defiled something whose cleanness is central to the well-being of the whole community. And yes, uh, violence is involved, although this is more 
um, the violence of a taser rather than a Glock here. Jesus doesn't kill anybody, um, but I suspect there are a few bruised and battered money changers by the end of this episode. When Jesus enters a holy place that has been corrupted, he, he takes on the spirit of Phineas, the zealous purifier. He drives out the animals, he breaks all the money boxes, and you can imagine the chaos, the, the animals going crazy, people shouting, um, money on the floor, or people on hands and knees trying to gather it up again. It's quite a scene. And there are two reactions that we read about to this episode of extraordinary zeal that Jesus shows. The first is the reaction of his Jewish opponents, and that is a reaction of suspicion and anger. Now, did you, do you remember in our New Testament reading, the Apostle Paul, he, he's reflecting on his missionary experiences and he notices that um, Greeks, Greek audiences, they want you to show that you're wise. They look for wisdom, but Jews look for a sign. They want to see some miraculous sign to show that you have the authority to say what you're doing. Well, um, that's what's hap happening here, that the Jewish opponents of Jesus ask for a sign. Give us a sign, they say, to show us that you have the authority to do this. The other reaction is the reaction of the disciples. They have a different response. What they see is fulfilment. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now that is a quote from the Psalms. That's a quote actually from Psalm 69. And it fulfills, it, 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 it speaks of fulfilment and in a few different directions all at the same time. So for instance, it's a psalm that's attributed to the King David. So here is a sense in which it, it perhaps is the fulfilment of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfilment of David's line. He is the king. But the psalm is more than that because it begins with a cry for help. Save me, O God. The waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire. And it goes on to describe this righteous man who is circled by his enemies. He's falsely accused. But in spite of all of that, he makes his prayer to God for deliverance. And it ends with a note of praise as God vindicates him and restores the fortunes of Zion. Now, the fulfilment on view, I think, then, is that of this Old Testament story of the righteous king whose zeal for what is holy will create enemies who will be falsely accused, who will sink under their assaults and their accusations, but who entrusts himself to God and is vindicated. And of course, that is not only an Old Testament motif, that is the story of Jesus, isn't it? So when we hear that quote in verse 17, zeal for your house will consume me, we look at what happens and we think it means consume with rage. But I think it's deeper than that. His zeal for the house of God will consume him in a much more powerful sense. He will be consumed in the way a sacrifice in the temple is consumed. He will be offered up as the temple sacrifice to God. He will be in the process, as he says here, destroyed by his enemies. As he indicates when he says to them, destroy this temple, meaning his body, and in three days I will raise it up again. So we see here is a moment of fulfilment, not just a momentary triumph of Jesus in the temple, but also a taste of what's to come, a taste of his coming passion and his death and even his resurrection. So his zeal and his instinct for purity is often seen as violent. And if that's one of the reasons perhaps we, we resist it, what we, what we see here in John chapter 2 is zeal and purity in a way that is very costly for Jesus. He's not so much the one inflicting violence, but the one who will be the recipient of violence. It might cost the money changes a few shekels, but it costs him a lot more. He will be consumed as he gives himself for the sake of the world. As he lays down his life, he purifies holy things. His zeal takes that which is holy but dirtied and at great cost makes it clean again. He is the purifier of the temple, but it's, it's wider than that. I want you to think of other representations of the idea of temple in Scripture. Places where God dwells with a particular intensity. 
We've seen one already. Jesus speaks about his body as the true temple. Of course, his enemies don't know what he's talking about. They can't see beyond the physical structure that they're in. But Jesus knows that it is in his body that heaven and earth truly meet, that God and humanity are truly reconciled. This temple of Jesus' body, well, it doesn't need to be purified. It's already holy. It does what the temple, the building can't do. It fully mediates between God and us. There are also other expressions of temple in the scriptures. Uh, For instance, the church community, the people of God. We are the temple of the living God. Or your own human body is described as a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul's argument, for instance, about why sexual immorality is inappropriate for a Christian is that your body is where the Spirit of God dwells. The whole world actually can be thought of as a temple. The way um, the the, the book of Genesis is laid out, it, it, it sounds like it's a description of the building of a temple when the creation is described. And so these things, our, our, our bodies, the church, uh, the, the world, these things are meant to be pure. And we may not like thinking about purity, we may not like talking about zeal, those things sound a bit highly strung, but we recognise the problem when these things are sullied, when they are impure. Just think of the church, the holy Catholic church. But it can be sullied by false teaching, people speaking out of their own imaginations rather than what God has instructed us to say, um, or in terms of behaviour. I reckon maybe the, the, if the church had shown a bit more interest, a bit more zeal about its own condition, about its own purity, then a lot of the damage done to people's faith in recent decades might have been avoided. Our own bodies, also temples in a sense of God's spirit, they are designed for holiness. We are image bearers of God. But we can become contaminated, can't we? We we can become impure. Impurities can literally make us sick. Or more fundamentally than that, our lives, our souls can be blemished. When we look inside and we recognise that we're not as pure as we thought we were, Well, the world around us, you know, it's designed to be a place of holiness, to to reflect the holiness of God and the glory of God. And instead, we we pump impurities into our oceans and into our atmosphere. Perhaps just think of your own life, where it's most practical and most real. As we read the Ten Commandments earlier in our service, did that make you at all uncomfortable? Were there little moments in that reading that made you think, well, Maybe I'm not doing so well. I thought I kept the Ten Commandments and actually, maybe I'm not. This is one of the challenges of the the life of faith. There are many blessings of the life of faith, but one of the challenges is that we're introduced to this concept of holiness. We reflect on the glory, the holiness, the purity and perfections of God. And inevitably, it shines a light on our imperfections. We come to recognise that we are not very holy. We are impure. That's really important. That's part of the journey into humility. But it can be a very painful journey, and sometimes for people it can even be overpowering. You can be crushed by this sense of of failure. I'm not good enough. I'm unworthy. And perhaps especially in this season of Lent, we, we, we look inwards. Uh, and uh, we try to take up the fight and we recognise that it's very discouraging when we evaluate our progress. Just as the effectiveness of the temple is lost when it's mixed with the impurity of animals and commercial activity, so our lives, their effectiveness can be lost when they are mixed, when our purpose is mixed, when we are diluted. This impurity, this imperfection, this thinning out of our purpose and focus can manifest itself perhaps in no zeal about things that actually matter. No lack of fo- and no focus. We're not together. We lack constancy or consistency. We lack a proper dedication to doing what is right. We get distracted. We're confused. And to all of those problems, we are presented with Jesus, the one who enters the holy place, including your life. He recognises that it's been contaminated. And he zealously goes to war to clean it out. 
Just as surely as Jesus' zeal caused a real stir in the temple, you know, he causes a ruckus within us as well. Uh, it's not easy. He was within us, he's within our lives, fighting for us so that we can be restored to our proper state. And in that process, enemies are made. There are parts of you that absolutely hate what he is doing. They are mounting their resistance. They are questioning his authority. They are hoping that they will defeat him. And in all the noise of the battle and all the conflict, you look inside and you might misunderstand what you're actually seeing. It may look like defeat. It may look like you're not making any progress. In the thick of battle, you might miss the big picture where the momentum is shifting. But Jesus' zeal is at work in you to purify you. And he doesn't promise that it won't hurt. There's a violent quality to this fight. Just ask the money changes. In the New Testament, the war against sin is often described in violent terms. It's about putting to death things within us. So within us, there's going to be disruption. There's going to be an element of chaos, perhaps. But you will not be lost. You will not be consumed by it. It is he who was consumed by this battle for you. His focused determination for you, his zeal on your behalf, meant that his body was destroyed for you, but was raised again. There's no question here about the ultimate destination. Victory is not in doubt. Yes, we are heading towards Good Friday. But just after Good Friday, of course, is Easter. This is a battle that his zeal will win.